let's let's make oh hello oh uh cool all right uh welcome everyone to the cultural inclusion workshop we're running for blockade imark uh and anyone else who's interested um so we're from uh, apsara and i are from the multicultural greens uh victoria um yeah, that's and so uh, so and so the 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 follow on from that is that Absara is my co facilitator and she will be staffing the chat. So if you've got any questions at any point, um, please bung them into the chat and direct them to her because uh, I'll be trying to race through quite a bit of content uh, and I'm not actually sure if I'll get through it all. Um, please download the slides. You should have the links. Um, I may have to skip things and then you can go back and refer to them later. Um, put it, put a shout out into the chat if I speak too quickly or, you know, I'm otherwise just running away from everyone. Um, all right, and after all of that, I'm Minhui, hello. Uh, I apologize for the fact that half of my face is in shadow, but that's just how my room is set up, sorry. Um, let me move, let me actually move on then. So before we begin, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which uh, we are all located, uh, each located, and pay my respects to elders past and present. For me, that's uh, Wurundjeri land, uh, of, so the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Um, for you, it might be different. Feel free to bung that into the chat uh, if you'd like to do that. I'd also like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and also pay my respects to any indigenous people who are here today. Uh, moving along, temperature check. I won't have time to go through a temperature check with all of you, um, but please take the time to, you know, uh, just do a little do a little once over of how you're feeling now. Uh, there will be a temperature check slide at the end, just so that you can keep track of how you're going, because taking care of yourself is very important. Um, moving along again. So introducing the facilitator, me, uh, and also the session, which is more important. Uh, so this is a very introductory workshop into cultural inclusion, uh, racism and white privilege. Uh, I will do my best to provide a broad overview of the key issues in this area. Um, the one thing I'd like to note is that because we're talking about things like privilege and systemic inequality, the stuff can be actually quite confronting and personal. Um, so for me, when I first started to confront my own privilege, um, that was quite, it took like quite a bit of time to digest. And it's actually, you know, the nice thing about Zoom is that you can digest it in the privacy of your own room without anyone staring at you and without me uh, firing terrible questions at you, which I promise not to do. Um, so uh, everyone, the other thing I'd like to say is everyone engages with this topic a little differently. Uh, obviously my perspective is not all perspectives. Obviously this workshop being de delivered by me will be de delivered from my perspective. So um, we've got, I've bunged a couple of, uh, I mean, I like them, uh, good links into the slides, um, both in the, the massive reference list, but also sort of underneath each slide. So you sort of know what each of the references relates to. So I'd really encourage you to go away and read all that stuff. There's a lot of great stuff on the internet by a lot of people of color who are much smarter and more articulate than me. So I would, you know, I mean, obviously go out there and this is the big, this, what I'm saying is this is the beginning, uh, go out there and feel free to, you know, uh, go crazy. Um, the other thing is that I may mistake, uh, misspeak and make mistakes and for that I'm very sorry. Um, and uh, just so that you get an idea of where I'm centered in this, uh, in this conversation, I guess, a little bit about my background, uh, which is a bit of a history of uh, the colonization of East Asia, uh, which is that in the 1800s, uh, China, and, uh, so China was invaded by England and a, a couple of their European buddies. This will become relevant eventually. That destabilized a whole lot of things, uh, not by itself, but you know, you know, it was a big contributor. Um, China became a really sort of unpleasant place to live for a lot of people. And for people in the south of China, they moved to Southeast Asia. So for my my father's family, that was the to the country that's now known as Myanmar. And for my mother's country, that's for my mother's family, that's to what is now known as Malaysia. Uh, when my parents got to about twenty ish, it became clear that those countries were also suffering from colonial hangovers. So yay! And then they made it to the mothership, which is England, uh, to to be educated and to marry back into the Chinese ethnic fold, I guess. Um, but for reasons up to and including that England was too damn cold, they moved here and had me, and so. What I'm saying is by that measure, I'm by some measures Chinese, but some measures not. Some measures Burmese, but not, not very many. Um, by some measures Malaysian, 
and other measures not, and some measures Australian, but by Pauline Hansen's measures not. Uh, so that makes, right, that, I mean, like, I guess, like, that's just a sort of, just a, you know, like, it makes things a little bit complicated. Um, but that's neither here nor there. So the purpose of this workshop, uh, as you can see, to build awareness of white privilege, to understand its structures, its sources, strategies for accounting for it, uh, et cetera. Before we begin, I'd like to get us on the same, to make sure that we're on the same page about what we're talking about when we're talking about privilege. And I don't want to teach you how to suck eggs. I'm sorry if this is, you know, basic. But um, when, we're when we're talking about privilege, we're talking about a set of social advantages or entitlements that people get from being part of a group. Now that's, we're talking about race today, but privilege doesn't just apply to race. Obviously, you, um, not obviously, but privilege, people can also be privileged by being parts of groups who are, you know, certain age groups, certain height groups, um, certain types of disability, uh, gender orientation, uh, sexual orientation, that kind of thing. It's very common to not be aware of your privilege uh, and, you know, uh, and having privilege doesn't mean that you got it as a result of your deliberate actions. You didn't, we're not saying that anyone went out and intentionally tried to squash anyone else to get more stuff. Um, it's more, I think that a better way to put it is that the system was designed for you. And so an example for me is that uh, a lot of buildings are designed for people who have no physical disability issues. And so for me, I'll walk into a building and I, and I won't notice the lack of, for example, wheelchair accessibility. I won't notice the fact that, I won't immediately notice the fact that, you know, some of the corridors are too narrow or, you know, that, 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 kind, of, that kind of thing, um, that the stairs, you know, layouts and uneven surface, surfaces and things are not friendly to people with different needs to mine. Um, but if I'm planning events and things, I need to be aware of those to make them truly inclusive. Or, need to try to. Uh, and the last thing that I'd like to mention is that people can have a mix of privilege and disprivilege, obviously. So I may have some set of racial privilege, but I've probably, uh, racial disprivilege, sorry, but I've also got class priv privilege because I am university educated. So, you know, so it's a, it's a mixed bag. It's, it's, you know, and it's, it's, it's complicated. So this is our first uh, activity. Um, it will go for 10 minutes. Um, we have so we call it got privilege and now you can't even see. So we don't really have time again to discuss this. So if I just give you may, maybe, maybe so, maybe, yeah, maybe until 20 past, um, if, if everyone who feels like participating can just read through the 16 points here and give themselves one mark for each item that applies to them most of the time, it'll just be a good way, I guess, of getting a measure of how, how, racially privileged you may be living in Australia. Um, is there anything you'd like to add up, Sarah? <laughs> Before I let everyone go? No? Okay, cool. Yeah, and maybe that like, if people are, are willing to also share, um, not, not of course, we're not forcing everyone to share um, your score, but if you are willing to share your score and maybe uh, talk about some of the, like if you did not have certain privileges, uh, like how, what does that look like? And I think it might be a good way for us to share, the, like contextualize what that looks like. Cool, let's do that. All right, uh, I will I will mute myself and then come back online. At, yeah, 20, in six minutes, in six minutes.
and that's time I think so I apologize to anyone who I'm cutting off but I'm gonna move right along uh, as soon as I can get this PowerPoint to work. Um, so before we open up the floor, I think just a couple of things uh, that I'd like to mention that we've, that have been generated from this activity in the past. So you get the benefit of previous people. Um, the first thing is that obviously you can see here um, that privilege isn't a zero sum game, that it is a sliding scale. Uh, and that was racial privilege isn't a zero sum game, neither is any other. But as I said, sliding scale and that non-white people uh, can benefit to some extent. So for your reference, when I did this, uh, I got an eight. So I'm in the middle exactly, which is that, so for example, um, so some of the, so for example, my, um, my skin is not quite white, but it's close enough that things like flesh colored stockings and bandages and makeup and things work for me uh and so um and so i benefit from the fact that that happens to be the majority sort of majority and in, in power thing um where and another thing is i mean a good illustration of privilege being something that you don't tend to notice that you have is that i didn't even realize that was an issue for people with darker skin until i made uh, a friend from namibia and so she and she made it very obvious that she's like well none of this works and i'd never thought about that before she highlighted that for me and it, so it's it's very easy to not notice things when they work for you because you just assume the system is designed you know like is running as you know as 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 designed well but anyway so the i mean the takeaway from that is to make lots of friends from lots of diverse backgrounds and talk to them a lot about yeah. things um the other thing that i'd like to say is that um not only is it a sliding scale but it but the amount of privilege you enjoy can change over time. So for people uh, of Middle Eastern presentation, I guess, after September 11, stuff got really dicey uh, for them. For people of East Asian appearance, life was particularly dicey when maybe in the period that Pauline Hansen first came to, to, to power uh, and then it got better and now in COVID it's getting worse. Uh, so, you know, like that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, and yeah, Absara, would you like to open the floor to anyone who's got anything that they'd like to share? Yes, yeah, so I think uh, Gustav, you said, Gustavo, you said that you had 15.5. Are you able to maybe share where you got your 0.5? Yeah, no, it could be easily uh, considered 16. It was just like the food thing because I'm originally from Mexico and I can get everything. But living in, in the city known as Melbourne, which is or in, in a part which is gentrified, I can find even though very expensive, like stuff that I would be able to get back home. It's just not easily available all the time. Yeah. But again, that's in the scale of priorities. It's yeah, just definitely. relevant. It's just, um, so it's really more like a 16 feel. That's right. But it still comes at a cost for you, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, food for me is one of the biggest joys of life. And that's what uh, I, I would say. I am privileged, so privileged that the, my only struggles are in like missing stuff I used to eat, right? That's right. Excellent. Thanks Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, that's uh, so true. And Greta, I, 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 hi, Greta. Um, do you um, want to share the fact that you got 16 and just a little bit about what you learned from doing this activity? Oh, I kind of knew I was already really privileged. So it just reiterated that I'm really, 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 really privileged. Mm. Yeah. Um, I was thinking maybe there was a few things because I'm not, I wasn't born, I didn't grow up here, but no, it was still 16. Definitely. And maybe I'll just ask Campbell, what was the one that you got, uh, didn't get Campbell? Sure. Um, I don't know that I, I, I probably gave myself two half points um, yeah. on, on a couple of them. So as somebody with um, Jewish ancestry, the, the, the issues around religion and speaking up, about racism, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of um, religion and ancestry combined. Um, and there are definitely times both at airports and at um, protests where because of my olive complexion, if I've been out in the sun, I have definitely been, um, um, been the recipient of um, racial, racial slurs, um, even though I'm not actually particularly um, yeah, dark skinned. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, that actually comes into play a lot uh, in places like airports as well, where they do go and pinpoint people. And I might just quickly share because I got only I only got six. Um, and 
I mean, and I'm a relatively privileged person who lives in inner city Melbourne. Uh, but for me, um, where I can definitely say I feel uh, a lot of that is looking at people in positions of power who don't look anything like myself. And also, um, you know, I'm acutely aware of the way in which uh, there's a lot of body shaping of people who don't fit into that kind of conforming into the kind of body shapes that um, are considered to be um, the norm, so to speak. And uh, just like with 13, I remember my experience in Cairns where I was shopping in a store and was followed the whole time by a sales assistant who obviously thought I was going to steal something and it was quite, uh, un it was very disconcerting. Uh, knowing you're being followed because every time you looked over your shoulder, that person was like had positioned said themselves in a way that they could actually watch you. And so, I mean, I only got to experience that in one in Cairns, but it, it is imagine if that's something that people experience every day. And I just want to share one more thing that um, Minhui and I did this training a couple of months ago, and uh, uh, a lady from South Sudan attended the, uh, the session and literally all 16 did not apply to her. So uh, we can see just how, um, just all the things that, the kinds of things that she has to experience in her everyday life, including things like going on a tram and being very conscious that she's being watched because of she's incredibly dark and the fact that people will walk across a tram to come and uh, hurl abuse at her, for example. So just imagine uh, having to live with that every day and try, and she said, has, having to make herself as small as possible when she's in public spaces. And she's a very tall lady, so you can imagine how stressful that is. I'll hand over back to you, Minhui. Oh, sorry for the no space, the no breathing time, but I'm gonna move right along. Um, the, this is, I mean, this is, this is probably, it doesn't go without saying it merits saying which is that having privilege doesn't of any sort but including white privilege doesn't mean you haven't experienced any hardship it just means that race won't be a factor and like an example of that is I guess street violence <laughs> um, if if you're like you can have all that you can get 16 on the test that we just did and go out in the street and like if there's someone out there who's feeling particularly violent today for no you know for no particular reason you might still be a target but you won't be a target for example, you won't especially be a target during a COVID con the COVID context because, you know, there's a growing group of people who think that uh, a certain group of people are responsible for creating the virus and they're an easy target to vent their frustrations. Right? That won't be an issue for you. That doesn't mean that violence won't be an issue for you at all. But moving right along, so to the meat of uh, this uh, presentation, uh, or the, um, which is that, so white was invented, it was invented to justify racism. That's a bold claim, but what do we mean uh, by that? We, so the concept of whiteness actually has no scientific basis. There's no group of, I mean, there's no, like the concept of race is not scientific. Um, there's no sort of group of genes that you can identify that any particular race or any, even, even anyone from the majority of any particular sort of country um, can be said to have that defines them as you know a certain ethnic group um, so whiteness I think we've already I mean we've already touched on sort of um, uh, uh, incidentally a couple of times it's it's a it's a shifting it's a social label it's a social it's a social idea and it and it moves right so the Irish in Australia used to not be considered white when it suited uh, predominantly English settlers to have someone that they could uh, pay less and exploit more, right? They didn't used to be white, but now they are. Now that's not the sort of anti-Irish sentiment is not really a thing anymore. Um, and so the 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 so the there's a great article in the slides about um, yeah the the history of of whiteness, which uh, tracks sort of the idea back to the colonization of the Caribbean and the Americas, where they there are records from the 1600s, I believe, uh, of of English people who colonized and settled there trading on an even sort of on an equal basis with African traders who managed to make their way to the Caribbean at the time but um so, but what happened was that in sort of when at the point in that kind of in in colonization when the English the English activities of like I guess extractive activities of like timber rubber cotton 
when it became clear that they needed a zero cost, like a zero cost labor to be profitable, I guess, um, the, the, the Europeans needed to go and find a work a slave workforce. And at the time, there were legal reasons that you could enslave other Europeans. So convicts in Australia would be that. You could be enslaved essentially for a period of time if you had certain criminal convictions. Uh, if you were poor enough in 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 England, uh, that also was a re that was also criminalized to an extent, and that was also a reason that you could be treated as a slave. But the problem for the problem for the the I guess the settlers, the settler col colonizers in the Caribbean and in the Americas was that if you brought they weren't number one, there probably weren't enough uh, of those of, of I guess penal you know labor uh, to to do everything they wanted to do. And the other thing was that Europeans weren't used to the climate and they weren't used to the local diseases. So a lot of people who were shipped over there as penal labor were dying off, which, you know, um, whereas Africans, uh, when, when they found out that that was a colony where there were people that they could either capture or buy from, I think Benin is one of the major slave trading, was one of the major slave trading ports. Um, they, I mean, that was that was great because great because people were immune to local diseases. People were used to the heat, the climate, could, you know, and could 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 work could be could be found in very large numbers. And all you had to do is create, I guess, a reason for them to not have the same legal rights as you. And an easy way to do that was based on whiteness. So they're not white. They don't get any of these right these rights. They don't need to commit a crime for us to enslave them or for us to not pay them. And so that's sort of that's that's what happened. And a, a, the a version of that that happened in Australia was, for example, the doctrine of terra nullius, which was where the settlers came here and just looked at the indigenous people and just decided that they weren't people. They were like, well, they, these are not people. No one. There's no one who has this land, so we can take it. You couldn't use the same doctrine in France, for example, the English couldn't have landed in France and said, terra nullius, no people, no, no people, because, you know, uh, because they'd have to, I mean, with the French, they'd have to recognize, they'd have to recognize property rights. But if you can come here and use white skin color as an excuse for people not to be people, then suddenly there's a whole continent for the taking. Um, so why, ooh, why does white privilege exist? Why does white, white privilege still exist is probably uh, the, the, the question that um, this is really asking. Um, and in order to answer that, I'm gonna take a step back and just uh, uh, sort of say that racism is usually defined as uh, a, a type of oppression that uh, arises from the combination of racial prejudice and power. So like that prejudice and power and that creates systemic inequalities that reproduce themselves um, across generations and across time right so I'm emphasizing that power is um, is 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 you know sort of necessary for that so in Australia um, roots of white history uh, the, the roots of white privilege are that Europeans landed obviously decided legally that they were going to exclude indigenous people from everything um, and then they built all of the foundations of the our societal systems that exist today and they built those in a time when overt and outright racism was acceptable. And they designed everything for their own needs. And when I say they, I mean like you know, for sort of male and upper middle class needs. So even so even white women even so nowadays sort of suffer a disprivilege from the design of that system. Right. And the result of that is a system that we've we've never rehauled that system, right, on this basis. So the system that they created at that time has been tweaked around the edges, but it's remained largely the same. And so just because that's how the system was, those are the interests that the system was designed for, um, uh, remain, I guess, the, yeah, so the, the interests that the system was designed for remain the interests that it serves best today. Right. And so and so the I guess the, the corollary of that is that there's corresponding disadvantage to people whose interests don't quite align. So to people who aren't culturally Anglo Celtic, where their cultures differ, then the system starts to not work as well. And so when we talk about systemic or institutional racism, that's what we mean. You don't need a person who's bigoted to operate the system. The system by itself now operates on a racially discriminatory basis um, and, and produces, and even sort of a neutral operation of the system now produces racist 
outcomes. So um, one of the things that also, I guess, has, has both resulted from and contributed to that is Apsara's point about all the people in power being not looking like Apsara and me. Um, so what you get is you get uh, from federation I suppose, and pre-federation, everyone with decision-making power was white and of a certain class and also male, right? And so now, look, there are more females in, but not that, not, not as many as are representative. It's changing a little bit. But what it is, is the, that kind of power also reproduces itself. Um, because if you look at the high court now, it's still mostly, mostly white and mostly male. Um, the LNP, who is the, our, our government, mostly white, mostly male. And like one way that that does reproduce itself is that people, yeah, people sort of in, in sort of hiring positions and in, you know, that kind of um, cooperative positions, look for people who look, who look and act like them, right? It's, it's not even, it doesn't even have to be specifically bigoted. It's just that the things that you value are the things that, you know, are the things that you've been taught to value, which are the things that you embody in certain senses. So you look at, um, I think when I was at uni, there was a, there was a comment to say that, so like at hiring, hire, the, in law firms, uh, you get sort of legal partners. And when they look at the new hires, they'll see like a, an old, an old a, a sort of grizzled lawyer will see a young white man and, and think, oh, he's just like I was at his age. And he shows promise in the ways that I show promise at his age. I will help him because I know that he can be of benefit to me. He will one day be able to fill my shoes. Not thinking that, for example, maybe the, like, you know, the, maybe the, the, the young lady of, of, of Indian descent might be able to fill his shoes in, like in a different way, might be able to excel in ways that they don't recognize. They just, everyone is just conditioned to produce the things that they know have worked in the past, which unfortunately were created by very unequal systems. Anyway, um, uh, blah, 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 moving, moving on. Um, the other thing that is sort of worth noting is that because power is a requirement for, I guess, uh, this is the really oppressive component of racism. Re reverse racism isn't really a thing. So racism by minorities or by sort of uh, people of color against other minorities is absolutely possible. Um, so I can absolutely be racist against someone who looks like Apsara um, with absolutely equally damaging consequences because I'm or I'm calling to a system that already punches down on her. Um, but if I want to be racist against someone who's Caucasian, that's a lot more difficult. There's no system for me to harness. So I can make their lives extremely difficult on an individual basis, but as long as they avoid me uh, as an individual, there's no, there's no issue. I can't, my, my prejudices can't, afford, uh, can't affect the job prospects or the quality of healthcare or their safety in the street. Um, you know, as, as one person and as, you know, like that, that's not, I just don't have the power to do that. Even as a minority community, there's just not the power to put that prejudice into action to, you know, result in, I guess, negative sort of consequences for other people. Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is at the, at the end of all of that, the reason that it exists and continues is the same reason that any inequality continues because certain groups of power pe powerful people benefit a lot and a lot of people who benefit a little bit don't realize that it exists and needs to be interrupted. Um, moving along. So why environmentalists specifically need to uh, care about white privilege and social justice? And the answer to, to that is that environmentalism as we know it was developed in a racist system. And so like everything else that was in, developed in a racist system, it's not race neutral. So the first thing to note is that the destruction of the environment, um, both the sort of both the causes of that and the effects of that are racialized, right? So when we talk about the causes of that, um, we can say environmental degradation on a wide scale started with colonization, right? Which is um, both in terms of people and resources is exploitative and extractive. Right, and so um, the largely in our history, colonization benefited certain types of certain European groups at the expense of others. So that's you know, so that the land clearing, intensive, not just intensive farming, but intensive farming in ways that mimic sort of 
the, it, like so it's I guess what I'm saying is Europeans going to for example Australia and the and what is now the US and planting crops that don't really suit those contexts uh, and then using and then just pulling out a lot more resources like water and you know sort of nutrients from the soil in order to force their traditional crops to work that was extremely damaging to the land more so than you know more so than sort of the nat like the the farming practices of the native people did a lot more damage because you were suiting you were forcing the land to do something that it wasn't designed to do and then you also get mining and you know that kind of thing and that enabled industrialization in europe which led to more pollution worse mining carbon emissions global warming um and 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 that's all benefited. That's all resulted in Europe being the de developed world, right? Europe and us and the US. Um, and still today, the extractive and damaging activities that we're talking about, like mining and logging and pouring toxic chemicals into the drinking water and that kind of thing, and that that usually happens in low income and high resource countries. So like certain parts of Africa, certain parts of South America, certain parts of the Asia Pacific. Um, it happens there, but it happens, it's done by companies and it profits companies that are owned here, that are owned uh, it from, you know, by, you know, people in England, the US, Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, and Australia, and increasingly China, but that, that sort of, we'll park that. Um, so, whereas the damage is left for people who are living in developing countries, the profit is all sucked up and, you know, and sort of taken by people in the developed world so it's like it's the same power it's the same sort of power relation continuing right and and i've already mentioned the effects there's the the short term effects which is that mines mines get built a lot closer to for example to residential areas in africa than they do here uh, or if if we're not including indigenous areas where indigenous people live right you would even if they found gold under Melbourne City or uranium under Melbourne City, which I hope they don't, they would never be able to move in and do the kind of large scale mining there and evicting people and that kind of thing that they are able to do in developing countries, right? Just because of, you know, power, money, corruption, all of that kind of thing. So racialized sort of power structures. Um, but then one step further, if we're talking about long-term effects or even not so long-term effects like climate change and, you know, food shortages, the disruption of, you know, all, all, all sorts of sort of, you know, systems that we need to sustain us, the, they'll cause, uh, this, this kind of activity will cause a lot more serious harm much sooner to non-white groups in low-income countries than to, you know, white groups in the developed world. So an example is, I guess, flooding in India, uh, you know, like although there's there's flooding now starting in Germany, it's not nearly as wide scale as environmental disaster in developing countries. And it's also that developing countries are not people in developing countries are currently sort of not as well positioned as people in developed countries to recover or to you know to yet yeah, to recover from environmental disaster, which we will also touch on later. And the final thing is that there's a certain class of people in the developed world who'll never feel the effects. So you get someone like Rupert Murdoch and someone like probably Jeff Bezos is so, I guess, I don't want to say old, um, but is is so, I guess, is of an age where they probably won't live until they will be affected. And for Jeff Bezos, even the effects that, you know, that, that, that will come, he'll be able to mitigate with money so anyway going on um because i'm running out of time the second the second sort of um reason why environmentalism needs to focus on sort of uh, needs to yeah needs to take into account uh racial sort of racial privilege and justice is eco-fascism um which is i guess i would say the use of environmentalism as a veneer to cover violent racism or violent right-wing oppressive politics so eco-fascists are the people who say um that the reason that we've that the overconsumption of resources that we have as uh, as a planet that the fault of that lies with people in the developing world because they're having too many children uh, and that too many of them are for example migrating to Australia and then creating larger carbon footprints than they would back home but if you break the sort of the implications of that down what lies behind that kind of statement I mean the developed world has colonized the rest of the world, destroyed the environment over centuries, but 
eco-fascists today are going to draw a line between that behavior and behavior today and say everything that happened before doesn't matter what happens is that now the tiny that yeah the 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 three extra children that you're having more than i am that's what's tipping us over into wide-scale env environmental disaster um which you know uh, and that's and even even if you drew that line and said only what happens now matters it's still not actually it still doesn't really have a basis because one person in australia has a carbon footprint that's many times over the 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 carbon footprint of one person living in for example rural myanmar right that that's just you know uh, it's 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 just it's not comparable um so moving further along uh is that even without intent if you're not why if you're not aware of racial issues um and and you try to go and put in a race neutral environmental protection measure it's it's not going to have the consequence it's going to have I guess racialized consequences. So one example of this is that in uh, Ecuador, um, they recognized the rights of Mother Nature in their constitution. And for them, the way that they did that, that meant that anyone could sue on behalf of Mother Nature, which is like, you know, a river, like, you know, a, a, a marshland, a week, you know, any, a, a forest or whatever, if if it was being destroyed and they could take it to court, they could take it to court and defend nature uh, on that basis and get the, the get the court to put a stop to activities that were harmful to the environment, um, which in theory sounded like a really good thing. If you put, like, I mean, if you say that's a, a, a law, the operation of law is supposed to be neutral, it's in theory open to anyone to use. But the thing is in practice, only people with money uh, and only people with, I guess, you know, a certain level of ed ed education are going to be able to use this law. And that's 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 sort of what happened uh, in, in um, in, in Ecuador, there was a case called the Vilcabamba River uh, and the provincial government of Loja. And what happened was the provincial government tried to develop a road and uh, stuff from the, the clearing and the, you know, the excavating or whatever they were doing to build this road was falling into a, a, a river. And, and like, you know, like, I mean, filling the river with rocks, but it was, you know, rocks. Um, but, uh, uh, but that gave rise to the first case of the use of the rights of mother nature. And it was actually a, it was actually a, a white American couple uh, using it and they used it to sue the government um, because their ecotourism business was being impacted. Um, so at the end of the day, yes, that river was saved, the works were stopped, but, um, but I, if we're talking about sort of losses, what, what, if the, the, what if the expansion of the road was so that, you know, people in remote communities could develop more like that could you know could could have if we could develop areas in remote communities and and lift people out of poverty what if you know like as in if what in another situation if you had indigenous people sort of suffering the same as in having you know like a I guess a miner come in and start to clear their land for for mining they would never have the means to be able to take that to court without external intervention right so the this law looks neutral but in terms of who can actually who can actually benefit from 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 you know laws i mean the the existing ex ex existing sort of um uh, inequalities are always going to i guess come out uh and the last thing is that the last thing the last reason that we should care about i guess white privilege and social justice is especially in australia white privilege um has really has really boxed us into a certain mindset of how environmental issues can and should be addressed uh and acknowledging that you know acknowledging that that is the case that that you know we have a bias towards certain you know, sort of certain sciences and certain types of knowledge that that opens the door potentially to looking past our worldview to alternative, you know, maybe indigenous, maybe more environmentally friendly worldviews. Uh, and that takes us to, oh God, I'm running out of time. Uh, I don't think we're gonna have time to do this as an activity, but oh, but all that I wanted to emphasize was that um, the, the, the way that the media talks about the climate change and climate action is also, I guess racially biased rather than you know, than sort of racist. So among all of these names, the only one I would be confident in 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 people knowing in mainstream Australia would be Greta Thunberg. She's and but the thing is that these are all these are all uh, climate activists who started working 
in their teens or their, you know, their youths in their teens or their, their maybe their early 20s. Um, and none of the others have gotten nearly as much coverage as Greta Thunberg, but that doesn't mean that they're not doing equally important things. So um, one example is that, um, for example, Ridima Pandey um, from India was part of a group that filed a UN complaint against five of the world's largest polluters. That seems like quite a, a big thing. Um, you know, uh, like, I mean, Amelia Telford is from Seed. She's Australian, but like a lot of people wouldn't know her name. She's part of, she used to be part of the Seed Indigenous Climate Change Network. I'm not sure if she's aged out of it. Um, but, you know, like it's a, it's, ooh, hello. It's, it's, it, but it's, it's the same, it's this sort of, it's a, it's a, it's, it's the same issue across sort of, you know, all of these, all of these um, climate change activists. And the reason that the coverage is, I guess the reason that I'm taking issue with the, the uneven coverage is that, when we don't know about these things, you all, you get number one, the idea that only, only people from developed countries, only white people from developed countries are concerned about the environment. But the other side effect is that a lot of people joined the fight for Greta Thunberg, who, you know, did, you know, like as in contributed resources, you know, went out striking, but none of the others were afforded the same level of resource. And that's such a missed opportunity. Like we can't, fight you know like we can't join good fights if we don't know about them is i guess uh what i'm saying um do, 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 uh, just to to move on um and this is just an illustrate like an illustrative uh, example of you know the points that i was the point that i was making before which is that with climate change i mean certain groups will suffer before others and some people you know some people probably won't ever feel the effects of you know what we've done. Um, moving along even further, uh, still, let me move along even further. Do, do, do. Um, yeah, this is, this is just uh, a case study of, I mean, we talk about the burning match and we, we when we talk about climate change, we're, we've often framed it in terms of the impacts being felt in, uh, it's probably eight, seven or eight years time now. It's probably like, you know, like we need to get, we need to change by 2030 we need to change by 2050 in order to you know like to live on as we have but the thing is that climate i mean climate change related disasters are happening now and i think there's a growing acknowledgement of that especially after the 2019 and 2020 um bushfires but the thing is when you get sort of small like i mean not small scale but relatively small scale disasters like that and if we're getting them more and more quickly um there will be obviously uh, an uneven distribution of the impacts there as well i don't think it's controversial to say that rich people will recover faster than if, you know uh, from sort of disasters from having their their house burned down just because they've got more resources right they've got savings they've got good credit lines they've got you know like i mean like another house probably um uh, you know like sort of you know certain types of employment like that will remain steady even through things like bushfires or even through pandemics um but but people who are not so social socioeconomically privileged will not right so people in sort of um people who don't I guess have, for example, people who don't have white collar jobs. I mean, if their area, like if their area is sort of, you know, burnt up by fire, there's their jobs are gone. Essentially, they don't have any to fall back on. They don't have any savings, which means that if they don't have any savings, it means that they need to borrow, and that means that they'll have to go into debt, even without a steady uh, line of income coming in. And then, like the situation gets worse and worse. So what I'm saying is that climate change disasters will will um, worsen uh, social inequality. Uh, in 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 that sense, um, uh, do 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 do. Uh, and the the other thing is that I mean, people who are if people who are not white are already disadvantaged in general terms, not in sort of individual specific terms. But if the general trend is that, for example, new migrants are doing who are doing sort of unskilled labour are a lot less well off than you know, people who are more established or even people whose families have lived in Australia for generations and generations, then this climate change is not going to be, it's not sort of racist by intention, but the impacts will be racialized. Um, this is just an additional uh, a note that racist attitudes are often strengthened during times of disaster, just because fear and stress are high and people are less able to, I guess, um, who are less, yeah, less able to self regulate their biases and they're less able to, to unlearn 
their their biases by themselves, like their bigoted attitudes by themselves. Um, and so that happened that happened during coronavirus, but it happens all over all, all over the world. So then that will be another layer of disadvantage that um, people of color, non and indigenous people will, uh, well, I guess, yeah, we'll have to deal with um, as the climate as, as the climate crisis worsens. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, this is, uh, I mean, we talked about, I talked about inter institutional racism earlier. Um, emergency services aren't uh, exempt from that. Obviously they came from the same system. And so in the, in the Australian emergency services sort of uh, framework, you get all the, a lot of the decision makers are Anglo Celtic in of extraction. Uh, and so a lot of the emergency workers. So because of that, um, the services are really designed for middle class uh, Caucasian needs. That's not like I mean it's you know it's it's just the the follow on from that. So you get an example of 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 that is um, that for example in bushfires, um, a lot of relief is 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 operated by the police. Now for Indigenous people that's not great um, because there's a there's an existing fear of engaging with the police for very good reasons. Uh, most you know relating to death Indigenous deaths in custody, but the the corol the consequence of that is that um, indigenous people might be a lot less willing to engage with police and to ask for help um, from police and and if that's the case I mean by the time they do it might be it might be too late um, then you also get um, cultural insensitivity in the design of emergency relief so that's seen in like for example um, the provision of food like that from of like emergency food supplies and things and we saw that during the lockdown of the Victorian um, public housing towers where um, the where the the government sent in uh, standard packs of food um, but because they were you know sort of designed for I guess things that um, things that I guess the mainstream population would eat. Um, there was milk uh, in that and a lot of, uh, this is not definite, but like a lot of non-European people are lactose intolerant, for example. I know that there were reports of them putting pork in care packages that were meant for Muslim families. And so like you just get, it's just, it's just mm, sort of, it's just unnecessary levels of, you know, to aggravation and trauma that happen in an already uh, sort of uh, traumatic, time um and uh, I'm, I'm really really running out of time here but this is the the next sort of array of slides are just um to highlight the effects uh of the 2019 and 2020 bushfires on indigenous people who were the most affected by the bushfires in terms of proportion um so you can see they're at two percent of the total population of the affected areas um but they were um, but you know sort of almost double that in proportion of the people who were living in fire affected in fire affected sort of yeah, um, um you know the, the fire affected proportion of those states um the um and yeah da, 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 sorry so then um here we've got this, this the, the gist of this slide is just it's just there's in because there's indigenous underrepresentation in planning specific risks um aren't accounted for in the emergency response and we can see like i mentioned the police but also sort of engagement with family services uh in the aftermath of you know because there's such a high incidence of um removable children from indigenous families putting family services sort of out there as 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 um that as the front line of emergency services is probably not a good idea because people again will be deterred from going to seek help but that wasn't done because there was no one indigenous in sort of the decision making rooms uh when when i guess these strategies were being planned to say hey maybe we shouldn't we shouldn't shouldn't do that um and the other thing is that because of um because of I guess because there was no one indigenous uh, in the planning of recovery funds, we we always put out recovery funds for, for example, pharmacists, uh, pharmacists, farmers and businesses and people who lose houses. But that sort of assumes that people need to own houses first. But there was no um, but there were no recovery funds set aside for, for example, um, traditional obligations to land the cut like custodial sort of duties to the land. There was no there was there were no grants given to indigenous people to to I guess deal with the harms that specifically they face and and 
and so then you know they'll have to so then they had to i guess pull into an already sort of strained pool of resources to try to to try to cover everything um you know additional additional needs uh, to the mainstream population um and then we've we've also got like issues like evacuation where if you've got a history of um being being removed from your traditional lands you're you're going to be you're going to be unwilling to leave even for your own safety if um there's no guarantee that you that that um the government will let you return or facilitate your return and so that just puts that it, it tips the balance of of um i guess risk in that people will be less willing to move and then that will put people's lives at more risk uh and then you you also get uh, as a, you know sort of as a as a result of the um exacerbation of racist attitudes during times of stress you get you you get like really overt examples of racism where service providers will actually turn indigenous people away um because of their personal racism and yeah and if there were if there were i'm not saying that if there were more indigenous people in so like in 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 emergency services that wouldn't happen but at least there would be people that you know that if i go like a so not just indigenous but like for a cull so um culturally and linguistic linguistically diverse um emergency workers if there were more of them at least people who are of color and or from you know um from migrant communities and people who are indigenous and know that they can go to someone from which they won't sort of encounter this kind of um this kind of attitude rather than it being a live risk no matter who they they go to ask um and i think i think i'll leave you to i'll leave this for you to read yourselves afterwards um this uh i just wanted to say so the the i mean we've we've sort of touched on this a little bit so um in in the general sense of uh, that everyone in so everyone in australian society uh, australian society should care about sort of uh racial inequality in this kind of issue because even though none of us personally did any of the things that created the system we all benefit from them so equally i benefit from them um and the, so the fact the, the very fact that we can own houses and land in australia and eat food that's farmed on australian land st uh, st stems from the fact that someone down the line stole that land from indigenous people and never made reparations uh, of 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 any sort um and yeah and the other thing is that obviously if we don't uh, this is a, this is a system that if not interrupted will continue as it has continued for hundreds of years so you know we if we're going to if we're go if we're going to sort of try to to um to save the planet um that's you know that's a that's that's something that we also need to do uh, in order to achieve our goal um so last section before the uh the major activity is just um I guess just emphasizing that racism doesn't have to be um, an intentional behavior. Again, I mean, we've covered this many, many times, but a lot of racist attitudes are, um, take the form of unconscious biases. Um, and and how, uh, where do I start with this? So we are programmed to, I guess, to notice patterns and make assumptions based on those those patterns, right? So like if you get, if if a dog growls before it bites you, and then it bites you. The next time you hear a dog growl, you'll not get with. You'll not let yourself be within biting distance, right? That's that's just evolutionarily how we are. The problem with uh, racial biases is that they're based on stereotypes and perceptions that are often fed to us before we have uh, experience with people of other races. So that's like the so um, that's like on TV. There are a lot of sort of for a period of time, all of the the Asian characters you saw in movies and tv shows were maths nerds uh for, or you know or proportionally that or like kung fu goons but like maths nerds and so there's a perception there's a there's a stereotype in australia that all asians are all east asians are good at maths uh, and that gets fed to people before they meet east asians so that that gets taken on as as like a shortcut kind of reasoning truth and then it gets applied to asians uh every every asian that you encounter after that um, now, if you'd met an, an Asian and spent more, enough time with an Asian, like me and my friends, you'd know that uh, if, if you've ever seen us try to split a bill at the end of a meal, you'll know that we're not all good at maths. 
but but I guess I guess what I'm saying I, I, but I guess what I'm saying is that rip that what am I saying I guess what I'm saying is that requires that requires you to go out and be aware of yeah be aware of the this the 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 stereotypes and the biases that you might unconsciously have um to go to go in uh, to to read I mean to to I put this really badly. Please edit this out, Anissa. But um, it, yeah. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, it needs you need to interrupt the the cycle of being fed a stereotype about something that you don't know and taking that on to apply to everything you do. After that, you need to go in knowing that the things that you see in media are, are racialized and not necessarily representative. So that when you when you sort of you sort of need to learn. We we all need to learn how to put that aside and sort of, and and sort of notice actual patterns, I guess, and, 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 uh, and, and work uh, from there. Um, and the other thing that actually it's, uh, it's, it's, it's um, worthwhile mentioning is that the stereotypes and things that um, we see on the news and in media. So for example, you know, like as in terror, like the, the focus on crimes committed by um, the, the terrorist cells that are overwhelmingly of Middle Eastern presentation, that kind of thing, that that uh, that people of color are not immune to taking on those as well, even about themselves. So what I'm saying is East Asian people are not immune to buying in to uh, stereotypes about Asians um, just through overexposure. Right. And there's a term for that and it's internalized racism. So we need to I mean, we need to unlearn all of that uh, as as well. Um, all right, that's I. I'm. Oh, oh gosh. This is this. Is, oh, so one last thing, which is that this was a the I. A, I don't know how many of you will remember, but there was a case uh, an indigenous death in custody uh, a, a couple of years back in Western Australia, um, and it was a woman that uh, the that was known as Miss Do, um, and so this whole case was just and it was a was an illust like a really sad illustration of what unconscious bias can do not at a level of something as relatively harmless as all Asians are good at maths, but at like a real level of accessing important services and, you know, human life. So for, for example, there's, so in this case, sorry, there's a, there was a stereotype and there still is a stereotype of indigenous people as being, you know, because of being from a lower socioeconomic bracket of being involved in uh, like, or like in drugs at a much higher race of being you know as in uh, being more sort of likely to engage in petty criminal behavior that kind of thing so um miss do was arrested for unpaid fines and when she was put into uh, jail um she was put into police custody um she was experiencing chest pains um later they found out that those were due to an infection that she'd had from a rib that she'd broken a while before, but when the police were confronted with that, they had a stereotype of indigenous people being, you know, I, I mean, drug addicted, but also like liars and sort of and petty criminals. And so when she complained, they they did take her to the 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 hospital at the sort of in the first instance. But again, the doctor had the same, I guess, the same preconceptions, I guess, misconceptions, and they looking at her through that lens they decided that she was exaggerating how much pain she was complaining of she was saying that they were 10 out of 10 and they thought that you know they for they it would be for behavioral gain which is i guess getting out of custody and then they just gave her painkillers and you can see that it wasn't just the particular doctor who saw her but the triage nurse thought that she was on withdrawal from drugs and so they they so they didn't they didn't conduct all of the the sort of medical examination that they would have done had she not been indigenous unfortunately um and so she was taken back and forth between between police custody and the hospital and every single time it was sort of the same the same thing the police thought she was faking it as well and then they they really they, they, they sort of treated her really roughly um which ended up in sort of with with her hitting her head on concrete um and after all of this, and I, I, after after all of sort of this consistent unconscious bias from every direction, um, she she died uh, of of a, of a heart attack, and it was absolutely, absolutely preventable at so many stages during this story. Um, so I mean, for us going out into the world and trying to unlearn unconscious biases, like I guess good tips for dealing with that is 
ask asking the question would I be treating someone in this way if they were white would I be assuming this about them if they were white or like you know even like of other groups would I be assuming this of them if they were you know Asian or you know whatnot um as I mentioned with the with the interrupting of sort of the false kind of stereotypes and narratives that we get fed by uh, movies and the news and other forms of media the best way to deal with that is to make connections with people who don't look like you um not sort of not not just like I guess seeing not to the extent of seeing someone in a store or like you know but like actually working with someone or actually spending time with someone I'm not saying that you should go out and treat people like tools for your personal growth but you know just just sort of more general exposure if the opportunity naturally arises. Um, and the other thing is that obviously to take into account the diversity of the media um, you consume both in terms of movies and who the directors are, who the actors are, who the writers are, um, and what I guess their racial their racial background is or their sort of ethnic background is, but also the the news. Like, you know, we I mean it's not like controversial, I think, to say that a lot of our news outlets have have very sort of distinct I guess agendas and racial biases that are quite clear um, and fight the system that made us this way. So now that I'm 10 minutes over my allotted time, I'm going to hand over to Absara, I think, to run. What we might do is uh, maybe what about we give people five minutes to ask questions. And I think I can see Gustavo had a question for you. And it also means other people. And then we can I can jump in and do the uh, uh, like start setting up for the activity. If you um, stop sharing. I uh, will stop sharing. We, and then you can answer some questions. How does that sound? Sure, let's do it. Let's do it. How do I how do I figure out who goes first? OK, so I think I, I can see. Uh, Gustavo has a, a question and if anyone wants to put yourself on a speaking list, I will um, maybe if you can put your hands up and I'll just check out the um, chat function, uh, the sorry, the participants. So Gustavo, do you want to head, uh, start off? Yes, thank you. Uh, I guess I would like to hear some advice in what would you suggest to make connections with people who do not look like any particular groups like how to do that in a sensitive uh, cultural competent way as you said not as a tool like oh i just discovered these issues i want to learn more like how do you build those genuine connections because i i've been frustrated in a way by moving here and when i migrated to australia then ended up in a circle which was pretty much just white anglo australian and then ended up just hanging up with other mexicans and and yeah just I, I thought of this as a multicultural place, but I'm struggling to find genuine ways to connect and expand my circles in a way that is respectful and that would have this um, long lasting effect. So any advice? Would yeah, be yeah, no, that's a great question. And it's Australia is particularly, I think, enclaved. I mean, like a lot of places are, but Australia is a particularly ethnically enclaved place. Um, for me, I mean, it's it's been easier for me because I mean, I've, I've lived here longer. So I had school and, and that kind of thing. The my workplace is is reasonably reasonably ethnically diverse. And so like, I'm, I mean, I've, I spruik workplaces because you see ethnic diversity sort of incidentally in like in a context it's not that you've gone so for example you could you could meet you could meet a certain you know people you could meet certain I guess ethnic groups by going to certain activities right like I'm sure that if you went to oh, actually I'm not even sure I would like to say if you went to a martial arts class you'd find a lot of like you know Chinese people but I went to a martial arts class and that didn't happen but like if you found another another activity you could go there but you'd only see people in the context of that thing whereas in in sort of the in in terms of like work you see people in a context that you already know and then you can see the different ways that they react to things and the different ways that, you know I'm not saying that you should change your job obviously based on 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 this um a good I mean for, for me a good way to get involved was um like a I guess a, a not volunteering necessarily like the multicultural greens to not to spook my own one but was was has been very good because it's it's specifically a group that's that's been put together to to deal with multicultural issues and then that's that's a deep a deeper engagement with multicultural issues like beyond sort of food and clothing that's been a deeper engagement because you you did we I guess discuss things like you know things that are effective affecting migrant communities 
at the at the at the moment. So like for example, like working working conditions for um, international students, that kind of thing. When you get involved in the you know that and you sort of ally yourself with with you ally yourself, you put yourself to supporting the groups that have been set up by the affected people, like inter like you know migrant students, instead of sort of going out there and 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 um, so, so supporting them and not sort of doing it on not on their behalf but like instead in if working with them and letting them steer I guess the 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 conversation rather than you going in and imposing a different solution that the I guess the experience of of sitting down and listening uh to to how to you know to to their point of view and how things affect them that has been very beneficial to me I mean yeah so I, I guess I guess what I'm saying is I mean my 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 bent would be to find ways to to maybe volunteer, like as in, you know, if, if like as maybe even to yeah to get involved in something that's I guess cause driven rather than if if you if you can't if you can't find um, if, yeah if you if you can't find a, a sort of um, you know like a, like a sort of a, a, like a place in your local area that that or like if if you can't find a workplace or whatever that's equally diverse. One of my friends. Um, one of my friends, this is, I mean, if you you like food, right? this is a bit of a tongue in cheek suggestion, but one of my friends who is white and who grew up in Australia has gone on an aggressive, like a, a, an aggressive uh, uh, a sort of COVID uh, uh, campaign to eat at all the local re uh, restaurants in mm. in ethnically enclaved areas. So he, he's gone to Footscray and he's eaten it. He's eaten not just once at every sort of, uh, African restaurant and cafe that he's been able to, but he's gone, he's gone back. Um, and it's not a deep engagement. Like I would have to say, that's not a deep engagement, but at least through talk, as in through talking at least about food, although I did say before that it's a little superficial, he has made time to speak to the owners of these, of like, you know, the restaurant when, you know, when, when it's a, you know, he's, he's exposed himself to the owners of, of these, well, you know, he's, he's sort of built up very casual relationships with them over time um and also he's he's starting on the vietnamese restaurants of the same area but it's something like you get you're not going to get you're not going to get sort of suddenly culturally intelligent from you know and like a sudden like you know a deep understanding of all of their cultures from that but it it sort of you start to unlearn maybe some of the fears you you, you learn a little bit and like even that so i would say that even though that's quite uh, a, a shallow level engagement. I think it's still meaningful um, just to, to make sure to, to talk to people as in for, you know, like a, a, a yeah, more than just a, you know, that'll be $5.60 please kind of interaction. I don't know if that helped, I'm sorry. That was no, great. thank you. This is great suggestions, <laughs> great ideas. Thank you so much. I think also just to add to that, anything uh, groups that actually materially improve the lives of migrant communities. So like, uh, with volunteering as well um because what that means as well is um you know what we think is a, a, a material uh, improvement might be quite different in those communities so you get a lot of insights from the community members about um the issues that those communities care about and also the way in which they view those issues and things like that as well so i think um any kind of volunteering that actually has direct connection with the community because Sometimes, like for example, uh, Gustavo, I just want to give you an example. I do a lot of uh, uh, refugee activism, and it's very much in many cases it's actually just uh, refugee activists rather than refugee activists led by refugees and asylum seekers. And for me, I'd rather be led by a refugee and asylum seeker, and like understanding it from their perspective. And I can see one person has a hand up. I'll just uh, it's Roger. Hi, Roger. Hope that helps uh, Gustavo with the- yeah, Thank you very much. Yep. Hey, um, sorry, is it my go? It um, is. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool, all right. Um, yeah, thanks, there was so much in all that. I'm a bit foggy headed today. I'm gonna have to go back and sort of do some digesting and stuff. Um, uh, the One thought that that's, that's, I guess I'll talk about now, um, with environmental activism tending to have certain kinds of implicit biases. And then I was thinking about activism in general, unless it's activism that's about your 
sort of immediate survival or your immediate struggle, it's going to tend to be more privileged people who, who can do the more, you know, noblesse oblige or whatever it is, or, or, or greater humanity kind of activism. So that's going to be a, that's sort of a, a kind of weird systemic bias about privilege in activism. Um, and probably that needs a lot by people with those privilege to kind of work against, I guess. I don't know. There's a lot. Of, do you want to comment about that? Uh, yeah. yeah, there's a there's a there's a lot. No, I agree. There's absolutely a lot, and it's not just activism, but it's um. So my uh, recent degree was actually in development. So that's like um. So like you know like the the UN and like you know that kind of program. Absolutely, that like all of the development workers are you know. And so then they go into countries yeah. and they say, well, we know what you need, and that's what we <laughs> had twenty years ago. So we're going to give you that. And that doesn't that that doesn't work, right? Um. Yeah. So I think one thing that I'd like to say about activist groups uh in particular is that we cut or activism in particular which is we cut this section because we had no time but intersectionality is like a thing that we all need to build into our activist practices right to, to understand that even if you're sort of trying to help someone on one angle like for example racial privilege um you can't sort of only focus on that and ignore everything else you need because sort of like there's people who are so people from multicultural communities women will experience racism differently to men like, so for example, I mean, we, we got that with the anti-Muslim violence, right? You know, women who are wearing hijabs would get, you know, a certain kind of attack on in public spaces that, that men wouldn't be subject to mostly because they weren't wearing, you know, and also because physically, you know, less sort of vulnerable looking. Um, but also like, I guess people with disabilities, like, like it, it, it all, it, it all, whatever, uh, whatever. But like a great, a great ideal for that for activist groups would be what, um, like Anissa's, uh, uh, the XR climate, oh God, climate justice and first people struggles group did, which was the one of the specific aims was, look, we know that we're, we're privileged. Um, and what we will do is we'll seek out, for example, what's relevant to our, our uh, uh, fight right now, climate is indigenous struggles, right? And instead of, I mean, we know that our space is not a safe space for indigenous people to come into because we all come from a very, you know, a very privileged background and microaggressions will happen. We just don't know and they shouldn't be our training ground to learn to be better. So what they, what, so what they decided to do was they were like, well, okay, we will, we will help them um, because I mean, in, in the recognition that all struggles uh, like sort of do tie together at some point or another we will help them. if we when we have time we will help them with their fight we will in doing that we will learn more about their fight and and how to conduct ourselves and not be you know and then maybe that will free them up after their immediate struggle for survival has been sort of helped along by us maybe then they will have the energy to engage with other struggles like ours. Now that's a very long-term strategy, right? You're not gonna, and I think the climate, like a lot of members of the climate justice and first people struggles working group are still, you know, like as an, it, it are still sort of still trying to show up consistently and still building those relationships. They don't, I think they've been building for maybe a year, over, over a year and a half, maybe two years now. That's not, you're not going to get you know, the other groups turning up at your door for your your struggles in, you know, like six months, one year, even like two. But it's it's a it's a it's a start, right? This whole space is really messy. Um and the really nice thing, I guess, that I think I read um I think it was an article in God, I don't even remember, but it was that it was that because of the because of the way that climate change is going to impact everyone and, and people who are disadvantaged more than 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 others. It really doesn't matter what social justice struggle you pour your your sort of efforts into, because in the end, it will um, you will be ideally helping some, give equipping someone to to better to better cope with I guess any disasters that come in the future by themselves. If you if you reduce a little bit of their um, of the sexism that they that they they experience, a little bit of the racism, a little bit of the poverty, at least they'll be that much, you know, and if you yeah, they'll be that much better placed when, you know, the fires and the floods come. Did that has that like is that sort of helpful at all? Yeah, also? yeah, definitely. 
Yeah, and I'll add to what uh, 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 Minhui said and uh, Roger as well, and then maybe we'll our last question will be from uh, Lewin. Um, just with that too, I think one of the things that we need to remember, I think it's you're right about the fact that um, you know even Minhui and myself are very privileged to be in this position where we can we have time on our hands to and we have the resources to be able to be involved actively involved in activism. Um, you know, one of the things that we have to remember is that most people, uh, including, this is not just only people from um, First Nations backgrounds or even people of colour, but just all, mo lo most Australians feel very powerless. So we have to rec recognise that. So we have to act, actually, the first step that we need to do if we want people to become really actively involved in activism is actually support people to and empower people to actually engage in our civic, in civic life. So it has to be simple things where people actually start to begin think like my voice can be heard. And I'm, I'll just share one of the things that we did in Multicultural Greens is uh, this year there was a, um, a, a Senate inquiry into family reunion programs. Now family reunion programs disproportionately affect uh, migrants from uh, from non-white backgrounds, okay? So the, the working group actually created a how-to guide, how to do a submission to the Senate inquiry and to share your story of, you know, of trying to get your mom, dad, uh, siblings to come to Australia and, um, and also talk about, you know, what are some of the things that can be done differently. Now that, and then we engage with migrant communities to actually get involved in that. Now, if someone makes a submission, it's their first step in actually being actively involved in our civic life. And when they see the results of the inquiry and then they see legislative change, they go, oh, I actually contributed towards this change. Which means that we can actually get people, then these people to step up further and do other things and more things. So I think one of the steps that we, the roles that we have to play as activists is think about how we can go into communities and empower people and think about it like from a, like, you know, in learning, we scaffold learning. And I think we should also be scaffolding involvement in our civic life as well, if that makes sense. And Lewin, I'm so sorry for jumping in, but if you want to ask your question. I know that's great, thank you. I'll just, oh, how do I put down my hand? There we go. Um, yeah, really useful stuff. Um, I have a question that is like not simple, I know. But, um, uh, if uh, I read somewhere an article talking about Black Lives Matter in the USA and talking about white people being involved and if you are, then you better be like on the front lines doing things that um, are more safe for you than people of color to use your privilege well. Um, and that makes sense, but also I think uh, XR has gotten um, criticism for like doing sit-ins or like having like having a focus on people getting arrested, which is more accessible to people of privilege and to white. Um, and I guess like my uh, answer would probably be to like use those. Uh, strategies but also have strategies that are more accessible um, but I was wondering about your thoughts about like a use them like b uh, make sure you have options c don't use them um, if they're not accessible. I think most of the criticisms that were levied at exile was that getting arrested was their main like was them their main sort of you know strategy and if that's if that's the case if that's the main strategy or even like the the or it it's not even that it was their main strategy, but it appeared to be their main strategy, right? It was the thing that people talked about, XR are the people who get arrested. And um, one of the things that, like, yeah, so, I mean, if, if that's the case, then it becomes exclusionary because there's an implication that people who don't get arrested aren't doing, like, the core of the work or the most important work or the what. One way that I think a lot of people tried to, um, tried to, tried to sort of combat this because, like, I mean, like I, I do recognize that there's a role for that kind of demonstration, right? It did get news coverage and it did get one. One, one of the ways that people try to, um, I guess, uh, use their privilege 
while doing this was to highlight it. So if they got arrested to yell out, I can, only, you know, like things like I can only do this because I'm white, like, you know, but I mean, unfortunately, like that's not really a situation where like you can get up the whole, this is what privilege is and this is why I'm here. And this is, you know, like, and I'm not, I don't want to shit on anyone. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, like that kind of, you can't, it's not, it's not a pithy situation where you can put out a five line quote, right? That's the, I mean, the, the, the problem, um, with that, I think it's, I, I mean, this, like, I mean, I don't know what the solution to XR's, like, you know, struggle is, but like, it's, it's a, it has to be a wider thing of, it has to be a, a wider change, right? And that's not, this is like going to be one of those answers that doesn't actually answer your question. But like, if you're going to, you know, as in, if you're going to make this, uh, you know, a main strategy, then if you get people of maybe not even just, not, not even, not even, not even, not even of like black or indigenous sort of uh, backgrounds, but of, you know, any any point along the racial spectrum in all of your training you need to highlight that we need we all need to recognize that um you know like yeah we're doing this because we're privileged we're not bet that this is not this is probably not even the most important part of the fight right this is this is this is one step of the fight that's necessary but not you know but not sort of more important than any other step and also that we can only do this because whatever and that if someone else who's not white wants to do it yeah i mean you can but be aware that your damage your damage is going to be different and you need if you're going to let people go in if you're going to let people go in and get arrested on your behalf you need they need also to be people who are for example white to do the support or like white and non-white but like the support afterwards so for example if people get arrested um maybe maybe you need people using their privilege to go to the police station and like, you know, and like harass the police into giving you information, let it, you know, letting people have their rights, that kind of, that access to, to, to things, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, as to like, I mean, things, I've read so many things about what works and what doesn't work now that like being that like we're still, like being that, you know, like where we don't have the benefit of hindsight, I don't really know what, what, you know, one one thing that I probably would say, like or to say, like I, I don't I, I don't really feel placed to categorically say don't do that and then do this or then do both of those or do this mix of things. One thing I would say is because we're all learning, uh, even me, because I also have boatloads of privilege. One thing is to be, the, I think the important thing is the way that you react when other activists pull you up. So with the Black Lives Matter protests, you got you you got people who you know where like you know like some something would happen someone else would 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 um be like okay look uh, you know white activists step back start listening you got a whole spectrum of responses from that you got people who responded really well and said i'm so sorry uh i you know like i that was i will you know like as in tell me like as in if you're i mean you're not you're not obliged to tell me because you weren't put on this earth to educate me. But if you want to give me your feedback, I will go and I'll do the reading and I'll do the whatever and, and I'll come back and I'll try to be better. And then you got ones who were like, no, -uh, uh, and that's, that's what you don't want to be. I think, yeah, I think we're all, because activism is not, there's no proven sort of track to what succeeds. Everyone's sort of trying different things. I think try different things, but be willing, yeah, be willing to be willing to learn and be, be careful, like as in when, yeah, as in insofar as you know how be careful of people who yeah who are who you're trying to represent or who have less privilege than you and are working either beside you or who you, you're trying to work for um and be prepared to be wrong <laughs> sorry yeah. yeah thank you um minhu and i think uh, but some of your questions, Lewin, might be also answered in the activity that we're about to commence doing, because um, it, it, we're talking about how do we create inclusive spaces. So it might also be one that uh, kind of adds it. So uh, I'm going to hop in now. Thanks, uh, Minhui, for um, all your amazing research and um, uh, imparting such great knowledge. Um, what I was going to say uh, in relation to this activity, and before we commence, I was going to ask is if we can actually maybe add another half an hour to this session so it actually goes to uh, 3.30, just because I want to do this activity in a really comprehensive way. I just want to see whether that's okay with people, if you can just say yes or no. Yes. <laughs> That's uh, fine. Can we just have like a five minute break so I can yes, fill in all of our own stuff? Yeah, let's do a five minute break and then we come back, okay? And I'll just put it. Might, might be a struggle for me, Sarah, but I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, and Campbell, we have the recording, so if you can't stay for the re the whole session, is is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, great. And I'll put this whilst we're having a break. I'll just put this up so people will know what we're about to commence with. Okay. Well, what about we come back at uh, two forty, so everyone has a little bit of a break. Excellent. Can get started. So hi everyone and uh, welcome back. I'm going to first start off with, because I just think I want to give you some context about what you're going to do before I go in and explain a little bit about uh, what we are, what this whole uh, idea of creating inclusive spaces is all about, okay? So we're going to use this framework and this is a framework that was created by uh, Shorta and um, which you will be using for an activity. We're going to put you into um, potentially um, either three groups or two groups, depending on uh, the size of the number of you of people that are remaining. The activity itself is going to take about 35 minutes, okay, 35 to 40 minutes. Um, 20 minutes of the activity will actually be allocated to um, you do your group doing a scenario and then coming up with a, uh, an uh, alternative that would actually create an inclusive space. So what I've done is that I've created three scenarios. One scenario is uh, where the person has been excluded. The second, uh, the other scenario is where the person has, um, is having to assimilate in order to be successfully uh, uh, feel like they're part of that group. And the la last one is uh, where the person, uh, they're, you know, like from a differentiation point of view, um, that their, their uniqueness is valued, but they still don't feel like they belong. So your jobs would be in A, to identify which one of those three your scenario relates to. And in B is to think about how you would you change that situation to create an inclusive space. Now, with that, I just want to be also very uh, clear with everyone. Uh, it's really great for you to maybe spend about, like if we've got 20 minutes, about five minutes on the first part, because uh, part A, so you're kind of identifying what the what this issue is, but really the most the most important part of this uh, activity is part B, because you want to be able to think about how you can actually create an inclusive space. Okay, so in uh, that is the most important part of the activity, and I would suggest allocating 15 minutes. Now, I would say that if this activity we had more time, we would actually have a part C, and a part C would be now look at the. Of the spaces that you are part of and think about how you can create an inclusive space for the spaces that you're in. So that is something that, of course, we are not asking you to do in this activity, but that's something you can consider that you could take the training to your own groups and think about that as a group about how you can actually create those inclusive spaces. The other thing, of course, is if you're interested, Minhui and myself and Martin are able to also come to your groups and we could actually work through an activity where we uh, extend that beyond A and B to actually critically look at your own groups and think about how you can create that inclusive space. So very soon, um, uh, group A, uh, when you, if you are put into group one, so I will uh, let you know if you are going to be put into group one, uh, your case study will be about Vashanti and um, it's on slide two of the activity slide. If you are in group two, your um, uh, case study will be about Hassan, and that's on slide number three. And if you are in group three, your case study will be about, about sorry, it's meant to be about Chen, so I'll just change that around. And um, you will, let me just make sure I change it. Yeah, change it, so it's about Chen, okay? So um, it'll be about Chen, and you, you will be given that activity there, okay? So now before we, um, break out into our groups. I just want to talk to you a little bit about these concepts here and then um, introduce you to the ideas and then so you get a bit of an understanding of what does it all mean. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now and um, just change it quickly to the, the main slides. Okay, so let me just open this here. Could I ask you as a group, uh, if you have the slides that are available to you that I shared with you earlier today, if you could potentially have this slide open, okay? 
So if you can keep this slide open, because I'm going to be toggling between slides and I will be, um, you know, talking about uh, other things as well. So I just wanted to quickly uh, make sure you have this in front of you at all times. And then when I move around, you still have that information in front of you. So the whole aim of this is that you're coming here and lots of people say to us, you know, we really want to learn about, um, about uh, the climate movement, uh, about the issues in the climate movement, but we really want to take action to create inclusive spaces. And I think that's really every the desire of everyone here today as well. And I think it is actually absolutely paramount that we do um, do this work to create an um, inclusive climate movement, one that is multiracial, one that cuts across class, you know, one that actually takes into account that um, we have different degrees of uh, uh, ability and therefore is inclusive of uh, a whole range of people, uh, peoples and their thinkings, ideas and perspectives. We have to remember though, like in the West or in, uh, in some cases we call it um, in the global North, uh, you know, the climate movement is uh, predominantly white and it's upper middle class. So you can actually imagine that does mean that we do create uh, through our own practices, um, of things where we do exclude people or make people who are trying to come into the group that may not be like us feel like they're not they're on the outer. So I think we need to remember that it's uh, uh, not necessarily intentional. Um, some of these practices are uh, very much done unconsciously. And so therefore I think it's really important for us to think about things in a lot more conscious way. The other thing we also need to remember and one that I just want to also to recognize is that when there is a very few people uh, from uh, marginalized groups to do um, uh, come into our spaces, we need to be very conscious that they are not uh, burdened with the responsibility of being the ambassador for all of their groups as well. So remembering that um, that puts a lot of uh, uh, pressure on that individual as well to be the token person who is representative of their whole group. So we need to be very careful about that as well. What we do need to do is we need to create spaces where people who are coming into them can feel that they are present, they are visible, and they have the opportunity to have their voices heard. So I think that's really important for us to think about as well. And also people who might not necessarily be in our group, and I think I was sharing with Gus, uh, Gustav and Roger um, a few things, is how do we uplift the voices of um, people from marginalized backgrounds or like in the case of climate movement from the front lines? Because at the end of the day, they will give us the perspectives uh, that are very important perspectives that we uh, are not able to see ourselves. And, you know, there's such a nuance, there's so much nuance to the way in which people uh, engage with an issue or, or how an issue actually affects them. And if we are not ourselves um, on the ground, we don't often pick up on those very, um, you know, that really um, a nuanced way of looking at an issue, addressing an issue. And I think it's very important for us to um, ask people who are on the front lines or you know affected to actually first of all talk about the issues that they're facing but they are the best place to also provide us with solutions and solutions that we can work collaboratively with them to actually achieve these so this model here is about considering the fact that some of our spaces might actually be exclusionary so I'm going to talk a little bit about what does exclusion actually mean okay so exclusion is where when an individual comes into a particular space, they might have unique skills, experiences, knowledge and insights, but we actually as a group collectively think of them as being redundant or irrelevant. And so we're therefore uh, we actually um, completely ignore um, their perspective. And what that also means is that individual uh, within the space feels that they're not part of the in, uh, the, the in group and they're not part of that community or valued member of that community. So this here, um, there's an example that we did create. Uh, I'm going to use the example of Fan, who is a Vietnamese Australian. And uh, we're going to use uh, 
door knocking as an example, door knocking our local communities as an example. So I just want us to go, like, if you can keep your slide open, I'm just going to go to slide 31, uh, uh, sorry, um, sorry, slide 30, uh, just so that you can actually see the example I've got there, but we can see from this example about Fan, um, is that he has unique insights about the Vietnamese uh, community. Um, he could add a lot of value to the door knocking team, but because of his accent, he's made to feel that um, that is something that, that he cannot contribute towards. And as a result of that, um, you know, he feels that he's not a, a, a valued member of the, of the group. So we can see here, this is a missed opportunity for us to work really collaboratively with um, FAN to um, create that really uh, inclusive kind of um, team where FAN's experience understanding the Vietnamese community and his potentially also work within the community and connections with the community could help us to um, actually work, a, a, you know, work well with them within the community, with the community. Now I want to move on to the next one, which is, uh, so if you keep your slide on, uh, which is about assimilation. So assimilation is where um, an individual's unique um, characteristics and insights and um, skills and experiences are often downplayed. And what we want people to do in that group there is we want them to be a member of our group and we do value their membership, but that membership in that group is very conditional. It's conditional that the person will change the way they think, the way they express themselves, the way in which they live their lives. And so this is um, very much a way uh, from a perspective of belongingness, that belongingness is very much conditional on that person adapting um, to the group. Obviously in this particular example here, uh, sorry, I moved, I think maybe one too far, my mistake, with Fan is that he is um, best placed to understand how to communicate within his own community. Um, and, you know, he can recognize that not all members of migrant communities really understand Australian slang, uh, but you can see here, uh, he do, does also want to be a very important, he wants to be a, a part of this uh, door knocking team. And so when he's, uh, when his uh, suggestions are kind of dismissed, he doesn't speak up and he thinks, okay, well, I'm just gonna have to go with the flow because he wants to be a, 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 an integral member of this group here. So we can see here, um, his unique perspectives are not really, well, are not really being considered. And, uh, and as a result, he has to make a decision. Does he remain in the group? And because he cares enough, he wants to remain in the group. And so therefore he decides he needs to assimilate to be a part of that group. Okay, and then the third one, um, which is about differentiation. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. So in differentiation, we do recognize that someone has a, some unique characteristics uh, or skills or insights and experience. So we do recognize it and we um, value it, but up to a certain point, okay? And that's why the individual might feel that, yes, they're able to share some of their opinions and ideas and things like that. But at, all po at some point they realize that uh, their, their opinions and uh, ideas and thinking and insights are not necessarily going to be accepted by the group. So there is that sense where they are valued until the point that they're considered to be useful and I'm putting useful in quotation marks, but just to like for us to think about from that perspective. But then once that occurs, they, we kind of uh, dismiss a lot of the ideas. And we can see here, um, FAN has been uh, valued up to a certain point but not really much further. And uh, even though he's been asked to be a, a part of the door knock strategy um, team, um, we can see here uh, his views and ideas and thinking is not necessarily fully appreciated within the group. 
And the last one, of course, is what we would like to be able to achieve. And I think um, one of the things that is really important if we are going to be growing this movement is creating inclusive spaces. And that is the recognition of one's uniqueness and also creating that sense that they can be a, belong within our team. They are a very important uh, member of the group and that their insights are valued by the group. And this is really important. So if we can see here, firstly, uh, uh, FAN is being recognized for their knowledge and understanding and experience of community. But in, in this case here, FAN also feels comfortable and confident in articulating that they are not all, that, that they're not across a lot of a, a few things, but they, are, they know that they will be able to feel supported uh, by members of the group so that they are, those areas or gaps that they might have can actually be, um, can be built. And so therefore they are being empowered in that case there. So we are recognizing um, the areas that um, the, the person has, uh, skill sets that the person has that is excellent, but also we're supporting the person in the areas where they might not necessarily have certain skill sets, knowledge, and these gaps are being filled rather than like throwing the person into a deep end and then watching them sink and then blaming them for the fact that they cannot, um, that they're, they're not surviving. And I think that is actually a very important part of inclusion um, because remembering that, let's say for example, Minhui, myself or yourselves, you know, your, uh, you, you, we've all been, uh, enculturated in our societies. We have um, social capital, we have cultural capital, and um, all of these capitals actually means we know how to navigate systems. But when we are speaking or working with people who might be, let's say, new migrants, for example, they don't have the same social capital or the cultural capital that we do have. And we assume that everyone has the same social and cultural capital that we have, but the reality is they don't. And so we need to create that space where people can feel confident about coming to us and saying, look, you know, uh, I really like this, but I'm not quite sure how this works. How can I get supported so I can actually build up my knowledge and skills and understanding of, uh, you know, in this particular area. So therefore we are building up confidence and empowering people. Before I, we go to the activity, does anyone want to ask any questions about the um, four types of um, spaces that we can create? I haven't been looking at the chat, so if anyone's been putting anything in, I might just... Or if, if you want to put your hand up and ask me a question or anything like that. I have a question. Uh, yes. Um, uh, I work on the Stop Adani campaign and um, yeah, there's a new group starting up called South Asians for Climate Justice that is part of the campaign as well. And they're really keen to um, recruit, you know, new members. Um, and so, you know, they've asked if, like, I meet people from a South Asian background who are interested um, if they would be keen to join that group. Um, and I am just thinking about, like, approaching that situation um, without it being, like, differentiation, um, where, you know, it's like, there's this really great group that you might be interested in, um, but, like, being like making all spaces welcoming, but also letting them know about that option. I'd love your thoughts on that. So maybe I might share and then maybe Minhui, if you would like to share some of your th thoughts. And I think that's a, a really good question. I would suggest maybe uh, Nina, one of the things that you want to do with uh, groups is if you can actually uh, set up, even if it's like a focus group, okay? where you go in and you say, look, I'm like, and you might even have a few people who might, uh, you might go with, sir, and you can get people to take notes down and things like that. Sir. But you might, uh, and you, you could even make it into something that's a bit semi-structured. So you have a set of questions, but then you can also delve deeper into a thing. 
is go into, if you can, first of all, identify, you know, in your groups, what uh, are the skills and experience and, you know, just also what are the requirements of people to successfully navigate your organization, okay? And then go into the, uh, uh, into these groups and actually have those conversations and listen to people about, you know, of understanding of how to, uh, whether they can do certain things. Like, for example, I became a secretary of a working group without any governance knowledge, you know. Now, that was actually setting me up for failure. But let's say, like, governance knowledge is a very important part of, like, I'm just making this up, right? And you know what is required for someone to have good governance skills is going in and actually determining, you know, just where people are at in that, in that particular area. Have they done things like this? Um, or, and then like thinking about it critically, how do you set up structures? So when you have people who enter your organization, you are providing them with the training and the supports and the mentoring and even shadowing uh, of people so that they, able to successfully navigate your organization and they are building up these skills and you're actually building it up in a way that they are it's like step by step does that make sense so that not there's not this big jump but it's step by step and what that means is when people grow in confidence they are going to actually be um, because they've gained these skills and a lot of skills we don't even like I always say to my own students right like a lot of these skills you don't wake up one day and say, oh, I'm now a good essay writer, but you can actually see it through your grades or things you're doing. And people will actually see that through the fact that they are being more effective in what they're doing, right? And that means that they become more, I think, is then what you will find is that they're more likely to stay in the organization. They're more committed to the organization and they're more co committed to bringing other people into the organization as well. So, I mean, that's my um, two cents worth. Uh, I mean, who would you like to add to that? I, I think you covered that pretty well. The only thing I think the only thing that I would say is that, for example, if there's if you're setting up um, like, for example, when you're when you're recruiting, let's say people from the South Asian community and you're setting up in within your movement, like a specific uh, South Asian group. I don't think I mean, I think I don't think that's I think that's 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 quite a good thing. I know that Kaz from oh, God, what's Kaz from <laughs> of Sarah? Tipping point. Where's Kaz? Yeah, that's right. Tipping point, um, which is, yeah, yeah. So Kaz was saying that, I mean, it's important. I mean, we want to include people in, you know, every space, but it's important to set aside a safe space for people knowing that it's, it's, it's not just about, it's not just about sort of equipping the, the new, the new corner of diversity that you're welcoming into your, your movement. It's also about training everyone else on how to, you know, because it's like, it's like both, both, you know, it's both sides, right? And so to have a, a safe space set up, whether or not your new recruits want to take advantage of it or not, the fact that it's there is probably, like, it's it's a nice fallback because I know that Kaz mentioned, and like, I, I experienced this to some extent where when you go into an activist space, you expect, I mean, it's to some level that it will be relatively progressive and you expect that because you're so you throw yourself in because like these are your people right you're here to do this this great thing that you're set out to do so when one of them and not even maliciously when one of them is inadvertently racist for example or inadvertently ableist or inadvertently sexist you you don't you haven't put up your defenses to that in the way that you would if you were entering you know like a different space right so then it hurts you more so um and then people get burnt out and emotionally, you know, and then they can't, and then like, and then, and then they don't want to continue this stuff, like dread meetings and stuff. So if you have a safe space, you know, sort of created for them to go into and like channels for, I guess, this kind of like, the, you know, these, like these concerns to be aired and like, that's, that's helpful. I think less, it's less, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, I think that's, it's, it's less sort of, setting someone aside and being like well you're you're different um but but more sort of accepting that like in sort of the transition period between you know what where we are now and becoming more inclusive we there are measures that we need to take to acknowledge that you know that inequalities exist I guess in terms of access and whatever have I missed anything up Sarah? <laughs> no I think you I think you're right about just being mindful of spaces that people are in
definitely. Yeah, so I'll add this here. And we might start the activity. And what we might do is we might actually uh, break it into two groups because I think um, a few people have had to leave, but that's okay. And th that means Minhui and I can, uh, uh, you know, make sure that uh, we're going between groups. So I'll just uh, quickly pop you into a uh, into group now. And then uh, Sonina and uh, Lewin and Roger, you're going to be in one group and um, Greta, Gustavo, Jack and Tony, you're going to be in one group and I'm going to join your group. So I'm in room one with uh, you and uh, Minhui will be in room two with um, the other group. So uh, group one, you're doing the case study about Vashanti and group two, you're doing the case study about Hassan, okay? So here we go. And we'll open all the rooms now. Uh, group two. Uh, who want, uh, is going to be the spokesperson in your group? And if you want to, uh, if you want to let me know who that is, then I can actually give you uh, uh, um, co-hosting rights. Was that group two? I'm sorry. Yeah, group two. Yes, Nina. Oh, yeah, that, that's me. Oh, we don't need to share screen because I just took scrappy notes. Okay, sure. Um, and yeah, so we spoke about. Um, I'll put the I'll put the thing up now so that you, uh, group one can see what you did. Um, you did uh, this one here, right? About Hassan. Yeah, Hassan. Yes. Um, I'm just gonna change my screen. Um, yeah, so we talked about like which sort of box we felt this might fall into, and discuss yeah that it felt like a, you know there was some assimilation going on, and that. Um, you know, Hassan was, you know, sort of, yeah, being expected to sort of conform to the existing like norms or priorities of the group. And that could, yeah, and the sort of particular and unique skills they had to offer weren't being valued. Um, and that, that could also, you know, result in them being excluded because their, you know, while their skills were being used, their strategic input wasn't being, um, heard or taken into account hmm. um, and in terms of yeah what we like might do about improving the situation um, we yeah talked about a bunch of things for example like what you know if for example we were to like you know question this group decision about it not being um, you know a good use you, of time or resources to focus on you know producing and distributing this flyer in Arabic then like digging into why people thought that and having like a conversation as a group um, and you know thinking about some you know like ways that we might counter those arguments and you know thinking about how you know the means of how we go about the work is you know just as important as the ends because we're trying to like live the world that we want to create um, and and having you know principles in our work that are more than just strategy mm -hmm. as well um, you know it's not like yeah I guess what we talked about was like there might be a sort of way that you could you know argue that it's really pragmatic to reach out to Arabic speaking communities but we didn't want to reduce it to just like a pragmatic question we also wanted to be wanted it to be like based in principles um, and yeah, so we just talked about a bunch of other sort of like comebacks that we might have with the group. And in terms of like dealing with that immediate situation in terms of trying to fix it, we thought that we would yeah want to talk to Hassan about what happened um, and how they're feeling and um, yeah, ask them how they would like to react and deal with it. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I guess we were talking about how we, you know, we wouldn't want to like go ahead without talking to them and like put them on the spot in front of the group or, you know, talk about their experience to the group without having spoken to them first. Um, and them having, you know, control over and decision making power over how to react to that situation. Um, and but that we would also, you know, provide any support or skills that we had about like how to navigate the group, um, how to, you know, maybe persuade people um, in our conversation with Hassan. So we weren't just like leaving the burden with them to change the group. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I guess like also just like, no matter what Hassan wanted to do, committing to, you know, I guess intervening earlier in the process next time to have a conversation about diversity and, um, you know, how important that is in the group and, and challenge any sort of things that are going on that lead to that previous outcome. Um, we talked about lots more, but that's just some of the bits I noted down. Did anyone want to add anything? You did great. And I mean, this is a common, uh, 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 just out of curiosity from yourself, uh, this is quite a common issue that occurs, isn't it? Where, would you agree, um, Nina? Totally, yeah, yeah. And we talked about, you know, how the sort of like, um, you, can use you know, lack of resources thing comes up um, quite often and, you know, small, um, activist groups and how, you know, we don't want to let that be like a, a cover for um, problematic underlying things. Yes, definitely. Uh, very good point. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's excellent. And I think this is a, a definitely a major issue that we have across board. And we will now, uh, I think you have a, your group has some really excellent insights of what you could potentially do. And we are going to do the first one, and uh, I'm going to stop sharing in a minute, but we're going to be looking at this uh, scenario of Vashanti. And I think, Greta, will you be sharing your screen? Just yeah, I'll share a screen. Okay, yeah. so I'll stop that and I'll just make Greta a, um, a co-host so that she can actually share the screen with us. But I think it's really, uh, sometimes when we see scenarios, it'll be, it's also good for you to go into your own spaces and think about how you can, you know, think about how you can change the, those dynamics as well. Uh, one minute, uh, Greta, I'm just trying to make you a co-host. Uh, I think I, also- I think I can. Yeah, anyone can share screen. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, does anyone else want to speak to Jack or Tony? Would you like to speak to this? Would you like me to? Oh, let's, yeah, can do. Just, yeah, that her, her uh, concerns need to be acknowledged in some way. And so the guy needs to hear around that. And there was various ways that, that we talked about that that could happen. Um, and maybe in some facilitated way and that the group as a whole benefited from that. It wasn't just a, you know, it was a learning experience for the whole group and a, maybe a, um, a trusting, a building of trust experience for the whole group. Uh, but just that it wasn't left to her to be, to approach this guy by herself for, from a, uh, a position of, she, she wouldn't, we felt that she wouldn't, well, I felt she wouldn't be, feel comfortable in that, approaching it like that. Um, Jack, would you like to add or um, Greta? Um, oh, we were talking about like um, creating frameworks for the group. So having um, a, like a, a periodic um, check-ins with the group to make sure people feel comfortable using their voice and do they have any future um, ideas around making the group better in the future or um, and then also talked about like getting some kind of education to the group about 
you know, intersectional frameworks and, um, yeah, stereotypes and things and, yeah. There was more, <laughs> Greta. Yeah, and I think, like, uh, uh, added into what you said, Jack, as well, I think in the group you were talking a little bit about um, the stereotypes and um, for people to understand historical factors and and I think Tony also talked about empathy training as well uh, for people. And I mean, I think also maybe debunking this whole argument around population, which I think is very important because um, the man might himself not necessarily um, be aware how population is actually used as a, a, as a, a by the white by white supremacist as a, mm -hmm. a as an anti-immigration thing. So, like I think those conversations around that with the person might also make them realize that um, the way he's raising it can have unintended but very um, but serious consequences for people in these communities that you know he's talking about as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think it's yeah, it's like his his vocal expression of that opinion is problematic, but also the other members of the group keeping quiet is problematic. So what Jack was mentioning about the the training could help um, make give them a bit more confidence to um, to speak up and also I guess show them it's vital to speak up as well. Um, and yeah, what you're saying up, Sarah, about the um, counteracting that argument and how it is linked to, to white supremacy. Um, I guess one thing that, because um, I don't know this fictional person, but they may or may not, um, Fashanti may or may not feel comfortable to lead some awareness raising discussions herself. Um, because yeah, it's, um, it's important again for us, uh, the the white people in the group, not to dominate and decide what's going to happen, as well. Definitely. So I was just going to like uh, finish off by just uh, like, and we'll just a few more slides relating to that. There's only about two more slides, but just uh, so diversity training, I just want to say, is a bit like our health and safety. And I was saying to the group before is. We need to, like, with frameworks and uh, that cre uh, for creating inclusive spaces, are frameworks that um, can actually be copied from other organizations. So, if you know of any organization that is doing it really well, you can actually go to those organizations and take their framework and then adapt and adopt your organization. And I, I was saying uh, previously as well is that um, this is one of the things that. Um, like corporates do very well is they invest in psychologists and organizational behavioralists um, to come into the organizations and develop a lot of these frameworks. So some of the best places to find frameworks is actually um, corporates like, you know, the, uh, the uh, banks and what have you, okay, even though, you know, and this is because they actually have the money and resources to do that when we are small or like, uh, activist organizations, we just don't have the capacity often, we don't have the um, of the mind, of the, of the um, headspace to create these kind of frameworks and things like that. So looking at what um, other organizations are doing is remembering that it's about these organizations are what they set standards and so they become benchmarks for what we could be doing. And so really we could be looking at that. And with a lot of these uh, processes, I think one of the issues that I think was highlighted both by group one and even Nina said in group two, was that we just don't have the time and the resources to be putting these in place. But think about it, if we actually set a, a new organization and we actually put all these processes in place at the beginning, it actually, it reduces all the attrition rates that we have later on down the track. But if we're already in a group, I think it's still prudent for us to think about it and. Um, think about how we can uh, put in place a lot of these kind of things that enable, and I think one of the things that we need to look at, and uh, Jack highlighted, is that we should always be looking at everything from a feed forward perspective. How can we continuously improve the organization? And so, um, the, and feed forward is about issue and solution. Every time we're talking about is, yes, there's a particular issue, but we don't just get stuck in the issue. We think about solutions as well. And that shouldn't fall on the person 
or groups of people that are affected, but actually on us as a collective to do that. So I'm just going to quickly thank you so much, Greta and Jack as well, thank for you. uh, <laughs> your contribution. I'll thank just really quickly finish up and then we'll finish for today. I'm so sorry, we're running so behind, but I hope it's been a useful exercise because I think um, even when we were in the group with uh, Greta was saying, you know, this like uh, this is a passive form of exclusion, but it is still exclusion. What happened in that case study, isn't it? Even though it's quite passive, isn't it, Greta? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Absara and Minhui and and um, Anissa's text for. Um, yeah, thank you all. But yeah, this has been really good. And Absara, I don't know if you're able, if you have any experience with some of the companies that do produce good uh, frameworks or policies. Yes. Um, is there a scope to send them in an email or something so that yeah. we can maybe have a look at that, like ones that you would you would regard as being like, yeah, great. To look at. Yes, definitely. 100%. I can uh, go and do a bit of research and, uh, and send through as well. And I will also send you all through the academic journal, uh, the Shaw Academic Journal in which that framework comes from as well, okay? So that'll be, that's my homework. So just uh, really quickly, I think the whole idea of, uh, is that uh, we are creating um, uh, and creating spaces where people of color can actually be included in decision-making processes, but I'm talking about all uh, groups of people who are from diverse backgrounds, um, you know, thinking about uh, how we can create that diversity. I mean, of course, um, like I've given some simple ones as, you know, pronouns, dietary requirements, but also I think one of the, our, our jobs is to develop our own cultural intelligence. So not expecting um, a, a, someone else to adapt, but if we develop our cultural intelligence, what we then do is that when we are in different, it's cultural intelligence and emotional intelligence are actually very much interconnected. And what that means is that it's about the intrapersonal and the interpersonal. We are developing uh, the intrapersonal skills so we can actually reflect on how we behave in a particular space, but also um, a, a recognizing that with our intrapersonal is that we, can, we need to adapt our behavior, but also the interpersonal side of it when we are, uh, when we are working with people from diverse cultural backgrounds is uh, adapting the way we behave with people from a uh, different cultural background so that we don't expect uh, someone from a, a, a different background to uh, adapt, rather we adapt and uh, we create those inclusive spaces. So our next workshop, which is um, uh, in two weeks time is actually about that. And um, I think just the next steps is really thinking about your own white privilege score, um, just, you know, like understanding the under why the, the climate movement is the way it is. It's uh, not by accident, it's actually by design. Um, just thinking about also our own, uh, our own biases and we all have it. And I think Gustavo actually had a really good uh, thing about uh, the uh, Harvard uh, implicit bias test. I will share a link for that as well because I think what Gustavo recommended was a very good idea. And, um, you know, Another way in which I think is really great for us to take it to a new level. And that's why I was saying, you know, like this inclusion activity, you could add a part C, which is how do we create inclusive spaces in our own group? Because we know when we gain knowledge and we share that knowledge with other people, we are practicing, we are actually putting into practice uh, what we have learned. And so through our actions, we are making those changes as well. So that could be something you can do. So just um, uh, maybe because we're not, uh, there's only a few of us, we could even go around the room and may, uh, everyone can maybe share your, um, uh, your feedback and also maybe uh, your final thoughts. So we'll start with you, Greta, because you're the first person on my list, if you don't <laughs> mind. Um, yeah, this was um, just what I said before. Yeah, this is really fantastic. Um, um, yeah, get me thinking a bit more about um, ways to improve as a human. Yep. Thank you, Greta. And Jack? The white human. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, you might be on mute at the moment. <laughs> Don't worry, I do that often too. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm very grateful to have stumbled across this on Facebook. Um, yeah, I'm really passionate about climate change activism and definitely want to be in a space that is intersectional and it doesn't clash with First Nations objectives, which is what I've found in lots of things I've been involved with. It's it's been white dominated with this idea of this is the more important thing than First Nations objectives. So yeah, it's really great to be in this space. Thanks everyone. And I've learned a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. And Tony. Yeah, I, I keep coming back. So yeah, it's very much a, a work in progress, I guess. And um, yeah, just about learning and and It, 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 we, it's dominated by white people, I guess. It would, it's, and I can't. There's uh, exceptions here, but, but it. Yeah, like I said before, there's never been more a more important time for this work to happen, mm. and so little time to do it mm. because of the emergency. So, but yeah, having these these occasions, these teachings, these learn, these discussions can't hurt and. We probably can't ha ha have them often enough. It's then making the links, I guess, and, and ste uh, stepping through those eggshells and making yeah. the links. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Tony. And maybe taking that next step and working with your own group to identify ways in which you can create those inclusive yeah. spaces. Yeah. No, already we already are. Yes. But, yeah. Definitely. Hi, yeah. Lu uh, and Lewin. Yeah, you got it. Um, uh yeah it's been really great thank you um i think it's like um uh, i kind of feel a little more confident in that i'm like oh i kind of know some answers that i could apply and like oh no it's i just think i'm not wrong <laughs> um but you know always good to learn more so i think that uh yeah it's um like being white i don't experience racism but uh having other oppressions, I can apply what does help me that yeah. similar thing as well. But yeah, always like the balance of like, how can I do enough in the right way and not too much in the wrong way yes. <laughs> or not enough? <laughs> so, thanks. Definitely. Thank um, you so much. And Nina? Yeah, this has been so excellent. Thank you. Really appreciate um, Ipsar and Minhui sharing your knowledge and um, your tech support, Anita. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I've got lots out of it, definitely like reflected on some things that I could have done better in the past, which is always useful. And um, I guess, yeah, I work with a lot of people who lead groups as opposed to like leading groups myself. And so I'm really thinking about how, you know, I, um, yeah, or how we can get this wonderful knowledge and talk it to more people in the movement um, and would yeah we'll probably be following up with you about that um, so really exciting really appreciate it thank you thanks Nina and Roger yeah hey yeah I I, I said earlier on that I'm a bit foggy today and I, I so I I feel like there's a lot in all this and to <laughs> kind of digest and integrate it I, I sort of don't know I, there's a bit of a don't know about it all yeah. just um, for me um, but I had I had a three other quick points. I, what I was reminded that something, I, when I, I was doing sort of climate justice activism and I encountered a, a non-Anglo um, academic, I think, and they said, climate justice, it's it's just justice. Why, why you know, it's just, yeah. And there was, yeah, anyway, there's a lot to that. Um, yeah, and a couple of thoughts just coming up at the end. This idea about trying to be ethnically or culturally or racially neutral um, or blind, or or about the the specificities of that, and uh, um, maybe that's a, a big topic. And then the 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 reflection I had towards the end again was in the context of this workshop. I think about what I would do in the Hassan example. But it, it actually, if I go back into activism, when you've got priorities shooting off in all directions, yeah, it, it might not be the same as in this workshop where it's it's all at the front of us. This will be partly integrated. But um, I don't know, you know, I'd have to question about how much, in what circumstances it would, I would, you know, yeah. Um, 
yeah, that's something for me to take away. Yeah, tough. Thanks, Sapes. Yeah. yeah, and I think well, you do actually hit a point. It's the fact that, um, you know, like we talk about this in what seems like a vacuum at the moment, but I think that's where, um, like sitting down and critically thinking about what are the uh, what are the things that you can put in place, like training programs, um, like support to, uh, for people, like, you know, complaints, for example, or, you know, those kind of follow-up actions if something happens. What are those things that can you can put in place that you can, what are you going to also do to ensure uh, you skill up, uh, as Nina was saying, uh, people such that you, you, so, you know, there's a really great leadership style called servant leadership. And servant leadership is the fact that you skill up people and then you take a step back. Yeah. And the whole idea is that then the people that you've skilled up do the same thing. They skill up more people and then they step back. But I think, you know, it's about power. How do we look at power and all those kind of things? And I think we need to look at um, those kind of structures that we can put in place so, to ensure that people feel confident and comfortable about letting go of power and, uh, and, uh, and distributing power across as well. And so those are like, that's a lot of work that we need to do ourselves, you know, to be able to um, build up that confidence in doing that. But yeah, if you're interested, um, some of you might be interested in coming in two weeks time when we are doing the cultural inclusion, um, a cultural intelligence training as well. We'll send that information as well, but it's been lovely working with all of you and you've got the resources and I will then let me send more of the links and information as well. And please, by all means, when we share these resources, we don't share them saying this is our property, they are property of everyone. So please share widely. <laughs> And please use widely as well. Okay, so <laughs> definitely. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks everyone. It's been a pleasure. So, and I apologize for the bit where I bridged my notes too much and then lost track of, and then and then yeah, rushed for time and got incoherent. But thank you for sitting with that. I appreciate your patience, and I will be better, like everyone else. Right, works in progress. We will get it. It was great. Thanks again. Everyone. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Apes. Everybody. Cheers. Thanks, Minhui.